Okay, so today we're going to talk about printmaking. So, so far in these modules, we've talked about drawing and we've talked about painting. So this is the same kind of informative, generalized sort of lecture where we're going to look at the different tools and different types of uh, media and material that are used in the broader category of printmaking. Okay, so there's a lot of different kinds of print methods. So um, some of the general kinds are relief, intaglio, uh, lithography, screen printing, monotype, and digital inkjet. And you can see in this illustration over here kind of what the difference between those things are. So I'm going to go over them all in more depth, but to start off, let's just look at this diagram and think about what these general things mean, and then we'll look at the subcategories within each of these and look at some of the particular tools and how the process actually works. When we say relief, when we're talking about relief in terms of printmaking, it's kind of the same as when we're talking about relief in sculpture, which I know we haven't talked about sculpture yet. That's next. Um, but basically, think of relief in terms of carving. So when you were a little kid, you might have uh, done a rubbing with crayons where you put a piece of paper against something that has kind of a different texture, and you rub a crayon over it, and you can see the imprint of the texture beneath. So the reason that you're able to get that textury kind of imprint is because of the relief. So the relief is basically how much the texture sticks up from the surface. So when we're talking about print methods, relief printing is when we have raised areas on a surface and the ink goes on the raised areas, okay? The next uh, kind of general sort of technique group is called intaglio. Intaglio is a um, Italian word. It basically means to cut into or to incise. So intaglio is kind of the opposite of relief. So in relief, the ink sets, the ink that makes the print sets on the raised areas. In intaglio, the ink sets down in the carved in divots, okay? So the incised areas, the cut into areas, um, are where the ink goes and that's where the print comes from, okay? Lithography is when um, you produce an image area on a stone or a substrate that is acting like a stone. Litho means stone, we'll talk about that in a minute. So the image area holds the ink. The non-image areas repel ink, so it's more chemical, okay? So it's like um, if, when you're making macaroni and cheese and the oil splits from the water, the oil sits on top of the water, that's because uh, oil and water repel. So it's the same kind of concept in lithography. So you make an image area where the ink will sit, and then you make the uh, rest of the area, the negative area, uh, repel the ink, okay? Um, and then screen printing is where you um, are passing ink through areas of a screen that are not blocked, okay? So basically, um, on a screen, on some mesh, you use an emulsion that fills in the holes on the screen and blocks the areas that you don't want to print, okay? So kind of the inverse of the image. And then in digital inkjet, which is a much more contemporary invention, um, microscopic nozzles, little bitty nozzles inside the printer, spray droplets of ink onto paper according to whatever data it gets from the digital file. Okay, so those are kind of the broad print methods, and then we're gonna look a little more closely at them. Here's an array of tools that are associated with a bunch of different kinds of printing, uh, printmaking that we're going to talk about today. Okay, so relief was the first kind of print broad category, and we're gonna look at three types of relief prints. This isn't exhaustive, there's lots and lots of kinds of printmaking, but here are the most common types you see woodcut, wood engraving, and lino cut. And this example I have of a woodcut is by Kathy Kollwitz. She's a very famous um, German expressionist, um, mostly painter, but she also did printmaking. So if you take Art History too with me, she's someone that you will learn about. Okay, so woodcut tools. Again, there's varieties in these, but generally this is what you need to do woodcuts. So you have a block of wood, literally, that's what you're carving into. Then on the left here, you can see the different kinds of cutting tools, and you'll notice the points are different kinds of shapes so that they can make different kinds of lines. Then you have your ink, and then you have your roller that you roll the ink onto the surface with, and then you have another roller that you roll the paper down flat against the uh, block after you've carved it. 
So the woodcut is a really old art form. It's one that's been around for a very long time. And in it, an image is carved into wood with tools called gouges. So there we have our wood and our gouges, you can see there. And then it's inked, so the ink is rolled on top. It sits on top of the relief, on top of what sits up above where you carved, and then printed onto paper or fabric. To make a woodcut, the artist carefully carves away areas of the woodblock that they don't want to print. So you're carving away the negative image and you're leaving the positive, the lines and whatever you're going to print, you leave those areas high, so they're the relief, so that's where the ink goes. The woodcut developed in Asia around the fifth century, um, and it was very popular uh, in the Renaissance. The most famous uh, artist that I associate with it in my mind is Albert Durer. So we have an example of one of his works. He's um, a Northern Renaissance artist who, um, again, is someone you'll learn about if you take art history. Okay, so here's just an example of a simple uh, wood block that uh, is a, an example of, of wood cutting. So this is uh, a very simplified kind of print that's uh, or wood block that's being carved to do a print and then you can see it with the ink on it what that looks like and then what the resulting print looks like just to give you an example of of how this kind of works. Okay um, wood engraving. Wood engraving is very similar to woodcut. It's slightly different but they're definitely in the same family but I still want to cover this because there's another kind of engraving that's an intaglio technique, not a relief technique that we're going to talk about in a minute. So I like to cover both so that you can see the difference between them. So wood engraving is a printmaking and letterpress printing technique in which an artist works an image or a matrix of images, meaning a bunch of images that can be mixed around like on smaller pieces of wood in a series. Um, and and they're, they're carved into a block of wood. Um, functionally, a variety of woodcut in that it uses relief printing and it's using kind of the same kind of tools as woodcut. Um, in this the artist applies the ink to the face of the block and prints using a relatively low pressure. Woodcut cuts along the grain of wood, so going with the grain of wood, whereas wood engraving is, cross, is cut across the grain. So it uses the same technique and the same kind of tools, but instead of cutting with the grain of the wood, it would be cut across the grain of the wood. And that's really the only difference. Some people would say that wood engraving, you tend to get a little bit um, finer kind of details because of some of the different tools, but you can, you can get very detailed work in either one. Okay. Leno cut. Leno cut is the last kind of relief printing we're going to talk about. And you may have done this in school. This is something I did in high school. I did in college too in printmaking class. But in high school, I think it's fairly common because the materials are a little bit more accessible. So Leno cut is a printmaking technique. It's a variant of woodcut in which a sheet of linoleum, sometimes mounted on top of a wooden block to make it a little easier to print with, is used for a relief surface. So it's exactly the same as woodcut, but instead of carving into wood, you're carving into a block of linoleum, um, which is definitely something I did in several art classes in high school, and I bet a bunch of you have too. But again, same tools, same kind of principle. This is an example of a lino cut by uh, M.C. Escher, who's a fairly famous uh, surrealist. Okay, so that's relief printing. There are other kinds of relief printing, but those are the big ones. Um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is intaglio. Um, intaglio is the family of printing and printmaking techniques in which the image is incised into the surface and the incised line or the sunken area holds the ink. So it's the opposite of a relief print. So instead of the ink going on top, the part that sticks up, it goes down in the grooves, okay? And the different kinds of um, printmaking techniques that fit under Intaglio, the big ones are engraving, dry point, mesotint, etching, aquatint, and photograveur. Uh, so we're gonna look at some examples and what those look like. Here's what the tools look like uh, for engraving. You'll notice they're similar looking, some of them, to uh, the woodcut tools. However, our gouges for engraving are going to have generally finer points and sharper points because uh, you're cutting into metal, not into wood still going to be using um, ink, but instead of using uh, just a roller, you're going to use these buffing materials to wipe the ink off of the part that of the plate that isn't carved down into, so it only stays down in the grooves, okay? So let's talk about engraving. This guy looks familiar. This is Albert Durer again, so we looked at one of his um, 
wood engravings. This is one of his metal plate engravings or more traditional engravings. Um, so engraving is the practice of incising or cutting a design into a hard, usually flat surface by cutting grooves into it with a burn. Um, so a burn is the same kind of thing as a gouge, like what we looked at with woodcut, except it's uh, specifically designed for engraving, and as I said, tends to have a little finer of a point usually. Um, it is the oldest of the intaglio techniques, and it was developed from the process of cutting designs into armor. So this is initially was um, created to be a decorative art form decorating the metal uh armor of soldiers in medieval times particularly to create these intricate kinds of designs and patterns in their armor. And then it was discovered that if they were filled with ink, they could be printed. So you could print like a crest or a design or something off of someone's armor. And then it became used as an art form because once you've made the plate, you can make many duplicates of it, right? So it kind of makes sense. Okay, so that is how metal engraving started. Here's just an example. You can see, um, the design being engraved with the burn into the copper plate. And then that's what it looks like. So you have your copper plate, you cover it in ink, then you wipe the excess ink off of the areas that aren't carved into. And then you roll it through a press generally. So there's enough pressure that it pushes the um, paper down into those grooves and gets the ink on it. It also makes a little bit of a, an, um, it makes it a little bit embossed. It makes a little bit of an imprint. It makes it sort of raised because it pushes down into those grooves. Okay, very closely related to engraving is dry point. Dry point uh, is similar to engraving, except the instrument used is a dry point needle. So this is literally a fine, fine tipped needle. The artist draws with a needle on a plate, usually the plate is copper. Occasionally you'll see dry point done with other kinds of metal plates, but it's almost always copper because copper is rather soft and easier to carve into. As the needle scratches the surface of the metal, it raises a burr. That's um, So when you're cutting in and you see that little kind of ridge of metal, um, this is what prints the image. So the ink gets stuck in the burr, not just in the groove. So it makes a kind of, um, it's a little bit sketchier, a little bit messier kind of texture. So the images are often slightly blurrier uh, than just traditional engraving. And a lot of artists who use it, use it for that. They like that effect more. It's more, uh, maybe a little more expressive or there's something more interesting texturally about it. Here's an example of dry point by one of my very favorite artists, Louise Bourgeois. And this is Spider from 1995. A mesotent is a print made from an engraved copper or steel plate, usually copper, because it's much easier to carve into than steel on which the surface has been partially roughened. So instead of just doing the fine point using a burn or a needle to do really fine point drawing, you also can just kind of scratch up a surface to make a general kind of um, rough area. Uh, and that area then holds some ink so it gives it some kind of shading. So it looks almost like a charcoal or graphite drawing. Um, so it's, it's partially smooth, partially roughed up to give a different kind of texture, to give a different kind of shading, different value levels. Um, and the technique was used the most in the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries uh, for the reproductions of paintings. So to get the kind of tonal qualities and varieties that you get um, in paintings, this technique worked better than just straight engraving. Okay, it's invented by uh, Ludwig von Siegen in 1640-ish, 1642-ish. Mesotint prints are distinctive in that unlike the other two uh, intaglio processes we've talked to, the engraver worked from dark to light. First, the plate is roughened with what's called a rocker. That's a blade that has um, teeth along the outside that you kind of go like this to make bunches of little uh, punctures in one after the other. Um, and so that's run over the plate repeatedly to create this kind of texture. If the plate was inked at this rough state, it would have printed a rich black. The design was um, created by the engraver smoothing out parts of the plate. So it's roughened up first. And then the areas that aren't supposed to be so dark are smoothed out to get rid of that, that um, the ink catching roughness, right? The smoother areas would hold less ink than the rougher areas. And then it's used um, with engraving as well. So the finer details would then be engraved into those smoother points, points, okay? So basically it's just creating a different kind of textural, different kind of uh, layered value sort of background through printmaking. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about is etching. Etching is uh, 
quite similar to engraving. You'll notice there's some similarities in the tools being used here. So etching is traditionally the process of using strong acid or mordant to cut into the unprotected parts of a metal surface to create a design in intaglio or incised into the metal. So while we have similar sort of looking tools that we can cut and make grooves with, we're actually using a, uh, a, a chemical solution to do most of the cutting, to do most of the incising, rather than just using burns or needles to carve into it. So here is an etching by Rembrandt von Rijn. Rembrandt, of course, a very, very famous Northern Renaissance artist. And you can see that you can get a lot of the kind of sketchy detail like you would with uh, an enriched texture, like you would with an ink drawing or with a graphite drawing, but all that is being created um, etching into a plate and then printing off of the plate. And here's just an example of uh, an etching, the, a plate that has been etched into and then printed from. Okay, aquatint. Uh, aquatint is another intaglio printmaking technique. It's a variant of etching. It's related to etching. Um, so instead of producing all these kind of fine little lines like we see in the etching in the background, you can see all the cross hatching, all those little lines. Aquatint is really only used to produce areas of tone. So it's very much related to mesotent. So as mesotent is to engraving, aquatent is to etching. So it's the same kind of thing. Um, and it's mostly used in um, conjugation with etching, okay? So that you do the background, the kind of soft tonal background with aquatent, and then you go back in and press an etching over it to get all the detail work uh, to give the outlines. It was invented in 1650 by Jean van de Velde. Uh, and to prepare a plate for aquatent, you first dust it with resin powder, okay? Then the plate is heated so that the resin sticks and kind of melts and makes an even coat. Resin resists acid, so when the plate is exposed to acid, it will heat away the plate around the resin, creating a pitted surface that holds ink evenly. So you can see in the background of this um, aquatint and uh, etching by uh, Goya, by Francesco de Goya, uh, all of that kind of noise in the background, that kind of soft, almost looks like charcoal, that's the aquatint part, okay? So it's, it's, again, it's more of a chemical process than engraving with tools. Okay. Uh, and then aquatint can also be used um, in conjunction with, you can print with color. So you have this background, all this blue background is by Mary Cassatt, who's a famous um, impressionist painter. She also did printmaking. And so she did the background in blue aquatint, and then she used dry point to create all the linear lines printed then on top of this. Okay, photogravure. Uh, photogravure is an intaglio printmaking or photomechanical process in which you use a copper plate that's coated with a light sensitive gelatin. So we're kind of getting into the realm of photography a little bit here, which we'll talk about photography a little later in the semester. So you coat your plate with light sensitive gelatin tissue, which is um, gelatin that's backed with a paper. It's, it's like a thin tissue paper stuck to gelatin. Um, and then you expose it to a film positive, okay, so that it creates, you create this, um, the negative of the image by exposing it. And then you etch into it, and that results in a high quality intaglio plate that can reproduce detailed continuous tones of a photograph. So it's basically taking the precision um, it's kind of taking the precision of engraving um, and photography, and then it's utilizing a chemical reaction with this gelatin, uh, light sensitive gelatin, so it makes it really, really accurate. Okay, so it's a little bit later of a technique. This is a um, photographer by Lorna Simpson, who's a very famous um, photographer. She does printmaking and collage as well, but she's a very famous photographer. Okay, now we're gonna talk about lithography, which is kind of its own thing. So here uh, are a selection of lithography tools. Um, so it's invented by uh, Aloy Sinefelde in the 1790s. And it's the process of printing from a flat surface treated so as to repel the ink, except where it is required for printing. So this is when I was talking about mac and cheese earlier, how the oil and water separate, same kind of idea. 
So you're utilizing um, a treatment on top of this stone, this fat, flat surface that will repel everything, the ink from everything except the area where you want it to print. Um, it's a planographic process, which means that the printing surface is flat, not raised. So we not like relief, not like intaglio. We're not carving in. We're not uh, creating a relief of any kind. Um, first, the artist draws the image on the stone using a greasy medium. So it's like an oily, greasy kind of thing. Usually tush, which is a grease-based uh, crayon, basically. It's like a, it's kind of like oil pastel, but it's softer. Um, then the stone is exposed to an acid solution. This binds the image to the stone, so the acid makes the greasy crayon image stick to the stone really well. Then the stone is dampened with water, which soaks into the areas not covered with the grease, because again, the grease repels the water, right? The greasy ink sticks to the greasy image areas that's repel and is repelled by the water-soaked areas. So usually these are made with limestone, but they can also be made using zinc or aluminum plates, but usually you'll see them in limestone plates. So lithography studios have stacks and stacks and stacks of literal stones. They take up a lot of space, they're kind of heavy to move, and then they've got the giant big lithography press. So it's quite a thing. Um, a famous painter, Edvard Munch, who is an, a famous uh, expressionist from uh, Northern Europe, he did the scream, the scream painting. So he also did uh, lithography. Lithographs were his other thing besides oil painting that he did a lot. So here's an example of one of his prints. So here's the lithography stone. So you can see the design is uh, drawn on there in the greasy crayon. And then when you print just the area, the ink only sticks to the areas where you've made marks with the greasy crayon. So it looks like that after it's been treated. So that's before acid bath, that's after ba acid bath and ink. Okay, next we're gonna talk about screen printing. So here's some screen printing tools. We've got our screen, we've got our inks, we've got our squeegees. Screen printing is when you force ink into a surface through a prepared screen of fine material, kind of fine mesh, so as to create a picture or pattern. Um, silk is often the material of the screen, so the process has also been called silk screen or serigraphy, which means um, literally silk writing. Today, synthetic material is also used and probably is used more than silk. Um, I think I've only done this with synthetic material. The printmaker blocks the areas of the image that are not meant to be printed. Whatever is not blocked will print because the ink will go through wherever it isn't blocked. Generally, to do this, you take an image that is the inverse or, or opposite, kind of like a photo negative when you look at the negative, um, of what you want printed in terms of positive and negative space. Then you coat the screen in a special emulsion uh, liquid and then you expose that to light with the image in front of it. Next you rinse the screen and the areas that were blocked by your image, those will rinse out and the areas that weren't blocked that were exposed to light stay and stay hard. Okay, and so when you put the ink on there, it goes through the areas that washed out and doesn't go through the areas that are blocked. If you want to make a color screen print that has more than one color, you have to have a separate screen for each color. So it's kind of an intense process. So think about that the next time you wear a t-shirt with a lot of colors. Every one of those colors, if it was screen printed, was a separate screen. So here's what a screen looks like after the... Um, Emulsion has been exposed with the image and it's been sprayed out really well and then that's the resulting screen print on the side. Um, in town we have a screen printing shop called Culture Flock. It's also a really cool store. If you go into Culture Flock uh, when they're doing printing and you ask really nicely and tell them you're an art student, they'll let you watch them print the t-shirts. You can go in the back and see how that what that process looks like. Brittany and Summer, the owners of Culture Flock, are super cool ladies. I suggest you go check it out. It's pretty rad. Okay, uh, next thing we're going to talk about is monotype. So a monotype, which is also sometimes called a monoprint, um, is where you make a design out of ink or sometimes paint on a plate, usually glass, sometimes metal. Then you put your paper or your fabric on top of it and run it through a printing press roller and pull it off and you get basically one-of-a-kind prints, okay? Because if you print the plate again, it's not going to look exactly the same. So it's a single print taken from a design created in oil paint or printing ink on glass or metal. You can do it with acrylic 
paint too. Um, so here's uh, Nicole Eisenman, who's a wonderful artist. She's, I mostly know her as a sculptor, but I thought this print was kind of adorable. Um, and so you create these kinds of images. So here you can see, here is a plate after it's been printed and you can see the resulting print being pulled off the top. This person is using golden acrylics to print with. Okay. Lastly, we're going to talk about inkjet because it is something that has been kind of taken into the artist realm. Inkjet printing, you know, is, is something that you, if you work in an office or something and have to print a lot, you know what inkjet printing is. That's what you print like your Word documents and things. But inkjet prints are um, basically just prints that are made from a digital file by applying very fine droplets of ink on paper. So um, there's different levels of inkjet, uh, but artists have been able to use this, this technology as it's developed. Um, if you see something called uh, gicle, gicle, a gicle is a neologism coined in 1991 by printmaker Jack Dugain for fine art digital prints made on inkjet printers. You'll see this at like auction houses and things, and if you see that word, all that means is an, is an inkjet print. It's just kind of a fancier word for it. Um, the name originally applied to fine art prints created on a modified iris printer in a process invented in the late 1980s. It's since been used kind of loosely to mean any fine art print. Most of the times an archival inkjet print, meaning the ink and the paper, it's acid-free paint paper, so it's of a higher quality and it's less likely to fade over time. Um, it's often used by artists and galleries and print jobs to suggest a high quality of printing, but it's an unregulated word, so there's no warranty of quality. There's no way to determine how high quality the work is. But basically, an inkjet is just a printing technique that is mechanized, right? Okay, so that is a quick overview of printmaking.